I suppose one of the things I'd really like to say at this point in time is that I'm struck a little bit by the level of complexity that exists really and the, and the size of the challenge that you guys face through it going forward in terms of looking at both not only the economic challenges um, but also about creating a, a new operating system really, I'd probably call it a new operating system and how do we do that in a way that the consumer, the end recipient um, of some of our efforts feels that it's, it, it is a benefit to them um, potentially, ultimate, ultimately really. Um, I would probably say about, about our experiences at a local level. Barnsley is a uh, local council, local metropolitan borough area. Um, it has a population of 220,000 uh, people. And we started off on our journey around uh, personalization by becoming one of the eight individual budget pilot sites that our Department of Health uh, identified back in, I was trying to think what the year was actually, I think it was back in 2003 or something like that. Um, and at the time when we set off down this journey, um, and I was actually the project lead for that work locally, um, I think generally people thought I was absolutely bonkers. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and really the appetite for change at a local level, uh, both with senior managers, um, uh, social workers, providers, um, e uh, family carers, that the size of the challenge was felt to be significant. There were lots of myths that existed um, around the agenda. So we had um, lots of uh, people like social workers that felt that it, it meant the end of social work. We had a lot of providers really, really worried about um, loss of block contracts. Um, we had um, senior manage managers in local government wondering what on earth would their role be uh, going forward. Yet we persisted with, with personalization, um, particularly personal budgets um, at that time. And what I would probably say that for us, I can only talk about ourselves, um, for us, personal budgets have been a really empowering part of the whole system change. And just doing that bit, however, it's very complicated and it was very difficult, um, it has actually been the catalyst for the whole change program for the local authority. Um, and I, I would really leave you with a bit of that message, really. You don't underestimate the power of personal budgets to make a whole system change. Um, a little bit more about Barnsley. It was interesting, actually. Um, uh, last few weeks, I got myself involved in a, a piece of work that we'd called a big conversation, uh, which was just basically getting out and about on the streets of the borough and talking to local people about um, their information, what they knew about the size of the economic challenge that, that, that the uh, UK faced, and, uh, and what their particular issues were in their local area. It was really interesting to me that I was struck by the overwhelming view um, from people in, certainly in the community that I was uh, um, working in, uh, that local people thought that it was the local authority's responsibility to fix all of the ills. Um, and that's at one end of the spectrum, yet at the other end of the spectrum, I was heartened to talk to a gentleman who was uh, 83 and was a, 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 a gentleman who um, had a chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder. Um, and you'll be maybe aware, I don't know, but uh, certainly South Yorkshire and that area of England has a um, history of coal mining uh, and also has high smoking prevalence rates as well. Um, and uh, he was talking about uh, the responsibilities of the NHS and he was coming up with a simple solution for his, for his uh, area where, particularly his area, there are a, a high incidence of people with uh, COPD. And a simple solution was really, you know, I'm, you know, we're going into hospital here, high cost to the NHS, to the Accrued Trust, in terms of um, bed management, bed costs. 
Um, why does the NHS not invest in more community-based uh, action? And for him, the simple solution was really just more benches for people to sit on that encouraged people who had got COPD to get out and about in the local community, but knowing that that community was having, as somebody with COPD, that you could actually stop and sit down, move on, stop and sit down. And it was really was just a very, very simple solution. So there's something about personalization in terms of harnessing um, the ideas and the assets of um, at local communities in terms of creating solutions. But Barnsley is a place is, like many places, um, challenged by uh, high levels of uh, incapacity benefit, mentioned high levels, smoking, binge drinking, other long-term conditions like diabetes. We know that the population, uh, the percentage of the population uh, over 65 in Barnsley will um, increase from currently almost 17% of the population to 22.7 by 2030 and over 80s up to 7.1 if our predicted trends continue. And sit, sitting that in the context of the um, financial settlements for local government have been shrinking significantly, they are shrinking. Um, out of our budget uh, for our council, 67 million is coming out of our our council budget, which forms about 30-40% of our total budget availability. So, I suppose really what I'm saying is, yes, we must absolutely need a new script for change. Um, doing what we've always done, and even though we have personal budgets, and I will say that in our area we have um, of 100% of people that are eligible for support from adult social care, 80% of those do have a personal budget already. Um, and that in its own right has delivered many, many, many benefits. In the context of a reduced budget of 67 million, um, we've got to sort something else out. We've got to create a new, a new way of working. And I've picked out this quote, actually, from um, an organization called Demos, which you, you may be familiar with, um, and a gentleman called Charles Ledbetter, who was... Um, uh, I've been a very, very strong advocate, really, in terms of uh, personalisation. And he said that public service reform should be user-centred. It should be organised to deliver better solutions for the people who use the services, but it must also, in the process, deliver better outcomes for society as a whole. Effective collective provision to meet the need for education, health, transport, community safety, care for vulnerable people. So the challenge is to build these two sources of value for the individual users and the wider society together. So think very hard about some of the messages that Vicky gave to you this morning about the significance of some of the softer sides of, of, of what we do and how we speak to our neighbours and all of those things that are absolutely uh, an integral part of this recipe for change. Um, some of those reports, demos, I strongly recommend you have a read of some of those demos reports. It would be fair to say I struggled um, a fair bit in producing these slides and, and I suppose it was because in producing some slides to talk to today, um, in many ways I was reflecting upon where we'd been, where we are and where we need to get to um, going forward and, um, and I've picked up really on the two, two dimensions of, of personalisation and uh, resilience. I think actually Vicky again actually mentioned the word resilience this morning but I, I think I've seen it in a couple of presentations. So if we think about personalisation, it's been about supporting as many people as possible to stay healthy, involved, doing the things that they want to do to achieve the outcomes that they are looking to achieve. And it's also been about delaying or avoiding the need uh, for more targeted services. It's about enabling choice and control, and it's about having, supporting people in our local communities to be better informed, to um, create their own solutions. And if you think about resilience being about the ability to recover, spring back, um, resilience can often just be used in the context of disasters, um, floods, those sorts of things, really. But it's really much more than that. It really is about um, personal, family and community resilience uh, going forward. But there is a key message in terms of resilience, and that is that excluded or disadvantaged groups often have weak or limited networks. 
um, and that often um, in being such an excluded or disadvantaged place, that this can restrict their access to resources, assets, and um, not that are receiving the benefits that, that that can bring. And another key message I want to um, plant firmly in the room is that personal budgets are really are an important part of the recipe, um, but on their own won't make the change that we need to see. Um, they are powerful, as I've said earlier on, they're very, very powerful things, but it really is about whole system change. Um, it really is about all of the things you'll hear Anders this afternoon talking about, uh, telemedicine, uh, telecare, telehealth, whatever you know, term you choose to use. It is the combination of some of these parts of the recipe that actually create sustainable change. And I would resist, I would strongly <laughs> suggest that you resist uh, randomizing projects in such a way that the golden thread uh, through all of them cannot be um, recognized. So I think about personalization and I think about resilience. So personalization in the broader sense is very much about um, if me, me, uh, it's very much about my family and very much about, about my community. And the job is to try and um, triangulate some of these things. So it feels, this is a really busy slide, isn't it? Um, it the, the, for, for us at, at a local level, we've worked uh, very long and hard at the right-hand side of this slide. And as I said earlier on, we've got lots of people living good lives uh, with their own personal resource as an individual budget. And that's achieved lot, lots of things. I suspect, I don't suspect, I know that we have done less of the left-hand side. And we have been, we've failed maybe as a, um, a strong term to use, but we have not paid enough due regard to the left-hand side um, of this model, really. So um, we need to really start to get a better understanding of uh, what exists, I work with local people actually to get a better understanding of what exists in terms of the natural assets and local communities. All of the breadth of peer support, I heard somebody today saying actually I don't think people realise how much of a gift we have in our local communities and maybe that's part of the start is understanding what we already have. Um, and supporting people and, and in there is organisations, um, local community organisations, voluntary sector organisations, um, I worked 13 years in a voluntary sector organisation um, and I'm sorry if this upsets people that are from a charitable sector in the audience but I will say it that um, some of the charitable organisations define themselves by their trustees. So for example uh, a learning disability organisation may define itself by just working with people with a learning disability mind people with mental health support needs, and on and on it goes. And there's been a real challenge and a job in terms of that sector to get them to collaborate and be more collegiate to achieve the outcomes that we all want to see. So part of our priorities is really, really doing a lot of work in this left-hand side. So resilience in terms of at an individual level, we're talking about you know, getting more informed, being a part of, uh, give and get, offering help, receiving help, uh, leading where you can, advising where you can, connecting to somebody, um, finding out where resources are, being more trusting. I, I, nobody's used the word trust, trust this morning. Um, I don't think anybody's used the word trust. Um, Personalisation really, really needs trust, um, whether it be about a family carer supporting a son or daughter with a learning disability, really, really worried about what a personal budget might mean. If it's a family of a young person with a disability that's um, worried because the reality is that the income that their son and daughter brings into the household sustains the household. So any, any uh, development work to work with a young person impacts on the household income. And there's something about really actually working at that level with families to work through some of those nuggets and some of those things that people face with every day um, and trust is a part of that. So if we were, uh, as an organisation, if we are supporting resilience, um, what would we be doing? Well, absolutely we'd be enabling people to take control 
of their own resources and personal budgets are a part of that. We absolutely would be changing the culture from um, what we would call uh, a professional gift model, so um, a prescription of what's good for you uh, approach. We would be joining up services. We would absolutely be stopping duplicative practice in people's front rooms. We see it, we hear it, it needs to stop. Um, we would be working across boundaries, the example I provided about the voluntary sector. And the role of commissioners changes. We, ha we have within our a local authority, we have a team of commissioners. Uh, and the role of the commissioners has been predominantly about contract management, uh, block contracts, commissioners to write strategies, manage the block contracts, procurement. Commissioners um, traditionally have held a lot of control and have been quite a powerful body of people uh, in our local government system. Um, and to be honest, uh, as a provider, I was absolutely fed up of commissioners because commissioners were my worst nightmare because commissioners often were not very um, prepared to give things a go. They were more focused on outputs and number crunching um, and as we've got into personalisation, the role of commissioners has to change. And for us, in our place, uh, commissioners, the role of commissioners is really then about market shaping, really. I'm not sure what else there is anymore for commissioners, but it's about developing and shaping the market because we put and place the money with individuals. Um, and that's been a really, really hard thing. So lots of things there we need to do. Um, role of the consumer in determining quality, changing the way we procure, incentivising enterprise. Um, telehealthcare is a real big one for me, and I don't want to uh, encroach on Anders' presentation and others later on today, but it's a huge part of the efficiency agenda, um, embracing telecare and cracking on and delivering, delivering it. So resilient communities, um, We've lost a lot of this in England. Um, I'm not quite sure why we've lost some of this sort of fabric of our local society. And maybe you guys are in a much better place than we are. Um, but things like being neighbourly, getting involved, trusting people a bit more, even knowing who's living next to you sometimes um, in our country is a, is, is a bit tricky. So um, we need to think a little bit more about what organisations can do to support resilient communities. Um, and one of the things that we're going to be doing, uh, and I would say, as I said earlier on, that personal budgets and the whole principles of personalisation have really been at the forefront of this, is really challenging how we are organised at a local government level. So for us, in our borough, and the leader of our council, council would probably strangle me if you thought, if you thought I was sharing this with you, but I'm going to share it anyway, um, is that that of, of changing the way that we organise things at a borough level to an area level. And that will also mean then that we have uh, money going to individuals through personal budgets, but we also have an area-based approach in terms of planning, which includes local people, identifying their own priorities, and taking money out of our budgetary system in local government and taking it and putting it firmly at an area level. So I'm not focused too much on that one. One of the trickinesses I think in terms of this agenda is about inequity. Um, I think it was something that Charles said about choice earlier on but um, so having more choice is not the only dimension. It is about more choice but it's also about different choices um, and I think that, that's a key thing for me. Uh, and there's a real careful thing here to, to think about because improving choice really does favour middle class um, uh, homes who, have, who do seem to have more financial, social and emotional resources. Um, but one thing it does do that personalisation by creating those conditions does enable um, releasing of resources to focus on those that need extra help. So it's having the resources in the right place, doing the right things to achieve the right outcomes. One of the things I would also say, I'm speeding up now because I'm conscious of the one minute thing here, um, is about challenging uh, how you do it. Um, if I was to critique um, our pathway to change, we have too many programmes trying to achieve ultimately similar objectives. 
Uh, and again, I suspect Charles mentioned this a little bit in his, in his presentation, really. So we have a new rocket that's fired up, which is called Troubled Families. God awful term, uh, but that's a programme. We have right to control trailblazers that um, are, are about bringing other funding streams into personal budgets. We have personal health budgets. We've got common assessment, public health reforms, NHS reforms, and on and on it goes. Um, and people are getting a little bit lost in it. So my plea to you all would be stitch it together and think long and hard about the scope. What's the change that you want to see? Final one, um, because I am very passionate about telehealth care. Um, Barbara, Barbara was a, a lady there, you could see, who uh, was uh, having a lot of difficulties. Um, and a lot of Barbara's difficulties impacted on family carers who were desperately trying to maintain their employment and their work. Um, Barbara benefited from a telecare package um, who uh, basically involved a property exit sensor. And using that, that simple, very cheap piece of kit um, enabled Barbara to stay at home and only three occasions were the family call, uh, called out. So over quite a fair period of time, um, major, major benefits there. The cost saving, because we can't avoid the question of cost and financial efficiencies. The saving was about 34,000, um, and that's just to adult social care, never mind the NHS um, investment in that. So last quote, and I'm going then really, age wrinkles, the body quitting wrink wrinkles the soul. If you're going to get on this pathway, be, um, be determined and use your heart and mind to deliver the change that you all want to see. Thank you for listening.